Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this OncLive Peer Exchange on the topic of evolving treatment paradigms for B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The past few years have been incredibly exciting in terms of improving our understanding of lymphoma biology and also developing novel approaches for treatment. We continue to define our strategies for treating indolent disease. In addition, we are making substantial progress in moving toward molecularly driven approaches for aggressive lymphomas. Today, I'm joined by a panel of distinguished experts who will discuss the latest data and their relevance to clinical practice. I'm Dr. Krishna Komanduri. I'm a professor of medicine and the director of the Adult Stem Cell Transplant Program at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center in Miami. Participating today on our di distinguished panel include Dr. John Bird, professor and director for the Division of Hematology at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Dr. Michael Keating, Professor of Medicine for the Department of Leukemia in the Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Dr. Leo Gordon, Abby and John Friend, Professor of Cancer Research and the Professor of Medicine in the Hematology Oncology Division at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center in Chicago, Illinois, and finally John Leonard, Richard T. Silver, Distinguished Professor of Hematology and Medical Oncology, Associate Dean of Weill Cornell Medicine and attending physician at New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. Thank you all for joining us. Let's begin. The first segment uh, that we'll be discussing today is the continuing evolution of therapy for indolent lymphoma. Uh, and we're going to be talking about follicular lymphoma first. And, and I would like us to talk about our approach to upfront chemoimmunotherapy. So Leo, uh, in, in the context of uh, our, uh, you know, our modern understanding of follicular lymphoma, what are our triggers to initiate therapy? Well, I think, first of all, um, most of the patients that we see, I think the majority of patients we see, we're observing. We still take a watch and wait approach. Many patients present uh, with lymph nodes as uh, enlarged as an incidental finding if they're being seen by their physician or if they have a CAT scan for another reason, they're asymptomatic, uh, and the diagnosis is made. And I think most patients can still be followed. And there are no data that suggest that earlier treatment offers a survival uh, advantage. Um, as you're following patients, there are a number of factors that go in to decision making about uh, treatment as you've been following them or upfront treatment right when you see them. Symptoms, uh, fevers and, and sweats and weight loss that might suggest a more aggressive course. Uh, the bulk of the disease, large lymph nodes, some consider lymph nodes greater than six or seven centimeters as being significant. Um, but it's also, to my view, I think location. Uh, you may have a small lymph node in the abdomen that may be compressing the ureter, and those patients might require an early intervention even with a smaller node. Cytopenias, which might suggest either a destructive cytopenia from a big spleen or a production problem from extensive marrow involvement. Those are, those are things, I think, that lead us to make decisions. But the next is about treatment, that once you've decided on treatment, there are a number of options. Uh, first, you can decide, I think, uh, you have to make a decision about chemotherapy and immunotherapy together, and that's usually rituxan plus some chemotherapy agent. But there are a significant number of patients that I think can be treated with upfront chemotherapy-free regimen. It's been historically rituxan. There are some interesting data presented over the past year or two and here at this meeting that suggests the addition of lenalidomide uh, might be important and might offer a response and complete response uh, advantage uh, in patients that you're considering chemotherapy-free regimens. But if you're thinking about chemotherapy and rituxan, and those are people that you'd like to respond more quickly, you expect that uh, they're going to need more intensive therapy because of symptoms or bulk disease. Um, there are a number of historical options. Historically, rituxan with uh, CHOP therapy, as was done for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, has been among the more common used regimens. Uh, the LymphoCare study that was published a number of years ago suggested that was by far the most commonly used regimen. Uh, rituxan with CVP, data from Peter Marcus, uh, suggested that that regimen is quite effective in inducing remissions. Then more recently, the data from Germany uh, by Rommel and his colleagues have introduced the drug uh, bendamustine to the armamentarium. And so I think I would say it's become probably if you will, a standard, if you think of a standard of care as a drug that's the most commonly used, I think that's probably where we are with, uh, with uh, bendamustine. So I think certainly rituxan and bendamustine has been 
uh, probably the more commonly used regimen, partly because the toxicity, the in initial toxicity profile uh, is favorable compared with our CHOP, and the response rates and the duration of responses appear to be quite good. We can expect maybe five-year uh, progression-free survival in patients getting rituxan and bendamustine. My concern with that regimen uh, remains uh, the, the, the fact that there hasn't really been long-term follow-up. The Rommel study, the follow-up is a little bit spotty uh, after the initial responses, um, and I think we're only beginning to see long-term follow-up, and my concern with that is that uh, we may begin to see second malignancies occurring in patients treated with uh, rituxan and, uh, and bendamustine. Now, are there patients in whom you think about uh, chemoimmunotherapy versus targeted uh, agents in terms of making that decision as, as these new agents have a greater role? I think it's a good question. I think that um, my sense is as we're seeing better and better data coming out th with the use of immunomodulating agents like, uh, like lenalidomide uh, and perhaps abrutinib, um, I think we begin to think about using that combination or perhaps even starting with a, a rituxan alone. You know, the data from the Swiss group, the SAC studies, suggested prolonged disease-free intervals in patients getting rituxan alone and sort of a consolidation course of, of rituxan and a short maintenance course. Um, the, so, you know, I think there are factors that lead at least me to kind of think away from initial upfront chemotherapy in patients with uh, follicular lymphoma.